Good morning. I'm glad you're able to take some time to devote to worship on this weekend. Uh, a note about this sermon that I've written for today. I wrote this sermon uh, a week after the political conventions of the summer. So I wrote this by hand, um, sitting behind the Shelbina Elementary School at, at a picnic bench there, because I realized that what I, whatever I was going to say about the election was going to uh, be the same, no matter how it turned out. And so uh, as I get into this, let me share with you a bit of scripture that inspires how I understand um, how we see ourselves as Americans and Christians, and then I'll share with you this sermon. Join together in following my examples, brothers and sisters, just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomachs, their glory is in their shame, their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. As I write this, it is one week after the conventions. The polls have tightened. Biden is up by eight percentage points in nationwide polling, and 51% of people, when asked, believe that Trump will win. And so here, in the midst of the question of what will happen, I'm going to write my response to the election. Why? Because the election is important, but it does not change what my calling is, nor does it change our task and future as the church? First, my calling. I am called and thus appointed to serve this church and its community. I serve everyone who walks in the doors of this church. This is not a qualified service. There are no conditions to that service. If you vote for Trump, if you vote for Biden, if you didn't vote, if you voted for someone else, that is all secondary to me. My task is to serve you. I am here to help you follow Jesus. That is what I said after the election in 2016, and it remains the truth today. Second, the role of the church. This church, as every church does, exists to make disciples of Jesus Christ, who then transform the world by the way they follow him. This means growing as disciples ourselves by our continuing commitment to the means of grace, to reading scripture, to prayer, to worship, to service. Right? These are also in means inviting others to become followers of Jesus to join us in this journey, and then to go out into the world to transform it, to serve. Our calling as a church does not depend on the state. The church has been doing what it does long before America existed. And I fully expect that the church will be doing this when one day America is no more. And so the response to the election that is months off as I write this, that has just happened as I share this, is the same no matter what happened. Jesus is Lord, and we follow him. Now, that does not mean that the church checks out of politics. I pray that more and more Christians will enter politics as a way to love and to serve their neighbors. I hope that a deep-seated commitment to being good news will continue to guide us as fellow Christians so that what the church does and what Christians do is welcomed 
as something to celebrate by our communities. For whatever the results of the election are, what I am certain of is that there is brokenness around us and division amongst us. To follow Jesus, the great physician and great ambassador, is to engage this, to listen, to seek and understand, and then to serve, to reconcile, to discern the truth together. To those who are rejoicing this week, you have brothers and sisters who are now weeping, both in this church and in churches around this nation. I would ask that you would listen and remember that this family is built on something greater than the American political party. In fact, I would dare say that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, that we dare not trust the sweetest frame, but we wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock we stand, all other else is sinking sand, all other else sinking sand. Amen. Usually at this point we move directly into a prayer. And usually that, that prayer is handled a certain way. We're trying something different this week in worship. For this week is one more week in the year that has been hard and is getting harder. I don't think anyone's going to get out of this year without scars. I've listened to teachers and hearing about the struggles to teach students who missed a lot of educational time earlier this year and how it's impacting them. I've listened to people who own businesses. I've listened to people whose loved ones are immunocompromised and at risk. I've listened to families that have been directly impacted this. I've been called and contacted by two of my own good friends who are infected with this disease, this COVID-19. Everyone is taking a hit this year. No one is going to get out of this without a scar. And if nothing else, the stress of the year adds up. The stress adds up and we get worn down. Yet, we don't tend to admit this we don't ask for prayer for ourselves, even though we know and we believe that the prayers of righteous people make a difference, to paraphrase what James writes. When we gather, we ask for prayers for others, but we do not ask for ourselves. Today, I invite you to take a moment to ask for prayer for yourself. Now, in person, I'm going to invite people to, to either anonymously or not to be able to write down what their prayer request is and come forward and, and to put that in a, a basket and we'll gather that so that I can pray for them during this week. Uh, my invitation is the same. I cannot offer you the ability to uh, ask for prayers anonymously because you'd have to email me or uh, text me or contact me whatever way you can over Facebook if you, if you choose. But the offer is the same. Please, let me know how I can pray for you. It is one of the essential ways that I serve this community is to be in prayer for everyone here. And to model the honesty that I am asking, the vulnerability that I'm inviting you to take on, I will tell you that I can tell that the stress of this year is impacting my health. It really is. It is, I am getting worn down, and um, there's a phrase from uh, The Lord of the Rings, uh, if you've ever read that or watched the movies, that uh, talks about um, when Frodo says he feels like butter that's been spread over too much bread. That was Bilbo Baggins, not Frodo. Okay, I apologize for my sin against The Lord of the Rings, but the, the, the point stands, right? I feel like butter spread over too much bread, and... and to be honest, I just have to say, please pray for me and let me know how I might pray for you. Let us pray. Lord, to pray after such a divided election is a challenge. People who follow you have voted against each other in your name. How do we make sense of this? And so we first pray for your church. We pray for humility 
for open ears to listen to each other, to seek your will together somehow. And then we pray for this nation that it might do what a government is entrusted to do and do so competently. Finally, we give you thanks for your kingdom, your kingdom that is coming, your kingdom that we yearn for. Help us to live towards it as we follow you. Amen. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you this day and always. Go forth now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.